Science Key Fist, um, talking about some projects I've been working on with Postgres uh, lately. Um, I'm a DBA for Omni PI. We're a uh, full stack support for um, high traffic web sites and applications. Basically, we'll provide support from down to the hardware level all the way up to application development, um, mostly for companies that have very high volume of traffic and have very large amounts of data. Um, some examples of companies we've worked with that you may have may have heard of are uh, Gilt, Etsy, Aura TV, Freelato, and a few other companies. Um, every year we uh, also put on a conference called Surge. Um, it's about this, most the the theme, prevailing theme is disaster porn. It's how things go horribly wrong and how you recover and fix things from that in uh, very large environments. Uh, it's annually in September. Um, you can check out MTI's website for the exact date right now. And of course, like many other companies here, we are also hiring. Um, I'm here. Uh, Robert Treat is the CEO. He did the previous talk about um, 9.4 features. And Dinesh Patel is another pe person here. So if looking for a job, you can speak to any of us. Um, this is the first project I worked on. It's called PG Extractor. Um, PG dump is pretty limited in what you can actually filter out as far as trying to get the objects out of the database. Those are pretty much the filters you have there, table, schema, and the P is for functions and it only works on PG restore. It actually does not work on PG dump. So, um, and it, the, it only dumps out the um, access control list and privileges for tables and comments. It only does that for tables. So. It was pretty limiting, and what you're, if you just want, like, want to get a function out or you, you're just trying to get a specific piece of uh, stuff out, it's actually rather challenging. So I originally wrote this in Perl. Um, recently did a version 2.0. Uh, they rewrote it in Python, actually Python 3. Um, you can run the 3 to 2 script, and it does work perfectly fine in Python 2. So, uh, but um, major thing is uh, you can see I, all the things I, I wrote up there that it can filter by. It actually puts each object into its own individual file. It's not in one giant uh, SQL file. Um, it organizes them into uh, folders and, and files like that. You can also do reg regular expression matching. So if you need to dump out partition tables and you know the pattern of your tables, you can give it a pattern like that. You can also give it um, uh, like a list of files and another, like a list of tables and a file and give it that file as a, as a filter. Do you only want to filter out those specific um, pieces of of code? Um, I had some other features in. It'll actually you can actually extract out the uh, default list and like the default privileges and stuff like that. Now um, I figure I can just go and do a demo of this. It explains it, shows it a lot easier than uh, me talking about it. So. Just want to do the database name. Uh, you don't have to give it a database name. If you don't give it a database name, though, it dumps everything out into the into the folder you specify at the top level or the default folder you're running it from. So I usually always give it a database name, so it'll put it into a database folder, um, and then just want to get everything. And you want to keep the dump file it makes, and also just to. See, it made the key folder of the database. So there's um, aggregates, functions, roles, schema, tables, views, all in their own folders. They run a tables. There's a, each every table in its own file. This is all. It all outputs in um, plain text, the plain text format. If you want uh, binary format, you can give the dash, the dash fc option, just like you can. It has most of the same options. As um, so then if you go to roles, uh, there's all the all of the roles it has, and I actually do have an option to filter out whether you can filter out passwords from the role. 
file. So if, you don't, if you're like checking this into version control, you can filter out the password hashes so it doesn't include them as well. It basically uses, the only thing the PG extractor uses is PG dump and PG restore. Um, when you originally wrote, when the original program this was um, actually like would log into the database and use and like rebuild things from the system catalog. That was for 8.3 and 8.4. Then 9.0 came out, system catalogs changed, broke the whole program. So to avoid having to rewrite this and, and keep it feature compatible, it only uses um, PG dump and a combination of PG dump and the PG restore dash L object list, it parses through that to get everything out. Um, if you have overloaded functions, it will put all of the versions of that function into the same file. It puts the ac uh, access control list for the functions in the file as well, so it tries to keep everything all together. Uh, let's see if I can do a, just show you this in real. Tons of filtering up. You can, I gave a get all, but you can do each integer one, get table, schema, types, roles. There's a get default privileges. Um, you can actually get sequences out. If you give it the data, it, it norm by default doesn't output data. If you want to get data out, you can give it a get dash dash get data ops, and it'll get the data as well. And it'll actually give you the sequence values as well if you get data out. Um, let's see, you can get rules. I try to give things as similar options as they are in PG dump as well, like n is schema, capital N is exclude schema, same with t table as well. You can, and you can actually give it a file name with each, each object on its own list. Uh, views, functions, you can filter by owner, which I found a lot of people have found. They only want to dump objects owned by a specific user. You can do that here. And, uh, it does have a, par you can do things, uh, run things in parallel. That'll help it go a little bit faster. There's the remember passwords options from the role file. Uh, uh, here. So, uh, it also is a actually a full Python class, so you can actually import this and use the public functions to uh, get the order, like the, the structured list of the PG dump, the PG uh, dump. Um, object list out and use it however else you feel you may need to use it. So try to make it useful in other situations as well. So, um, any questions about this tool? Where do you get this? Uh, I have links at the end with a where I can get. Um, OmniTI has our own uh, uh, labs, um, Git, Git repository, and for my Git repository, I have links to all of the all the things. I'll have them at the end. Any other questions? All of my other tools I'll be talking about from that from here on out are all extensions. Um, the extension system was introduced in 9.1. Uh, that basically describes what extensions are, it's logically grouping things together in a, in, an or, in a way that's easier to control. All of the contrib modules that are on Postgres are actually extensions now as of 9.1. So they're all version 1.0 as far as I can tell and hasn't been updated. But you can have actually version controlled uh, groups of obje objects in the database now allows more controlled updates of your of your code and allows things to be more um, what's the word? if you have the same code installed in multiple databases like you probably would you can make sure they're all running the same versions of the same code and it al allows predictable updates and if if the author of the extension provides it you can actually downgrade as well in a predictable way so allows thing allows control of your the code in your database mostly functions um, you can put tables in extensions, but the extension authors didn't really intend tables for anything other than configuration data. So, because when you do a PG dump, you don't actually dump out any of the extension code. It all it dumps out, all it creates is a create extension whatever in your dump file. So, if you need that data, you can set a flag on your uh, extension table to include to be included in PG dumps. But then that also includes your table and schema dump with the data. So if you have very, very large tables as part of your extension, you'll be dumping out all of that data as part of your schema. So I'm hoping they make the extension system a little bit more flexible. 
but um, so far it's it's worked great. You can write you can write extensions in any language, just like Postgres functions, C, Perl, Python, whatever you need to do. Um, this is the first extension I worked on. It was uh, uh, so it's autonomous functions is a feature that's missing from Postgres. What that basically means is you can't do multiple begins and commits in a single function, so you can't like loop over things and and keep things going if you if uh, and that means everything that runs in a function if that function fails everything it did rolls back so if you try to um, like have monitoring on a function you want to log the steps of the function and see where it fails and if that function failed you would roll back all everything you logged so you would have no idea where it failed and why it failed so this extension was written um, it was actually code we actually had written back in 8.2 and 8.3 but when 9.1 came out I kind of uh, organize it a little bit better so we can keep code in sync across our different clients. So this allows you to log the individual steps of a function by using a, a dblink trick. The dblink is another extension. All dblink does is allow you to connect to another Postgres database and do whatever you want. So you use dblink to connect back to the same database and you basically make um, individual sessions that are individual transactions that can be committed. So it does add a little bit of overhead to your functions but um, usually the functions that we're running, the overhead is negligible, and the monitoring of the function is much more important than the overhead it adds on to it. So um, it also allows um, you to integrate monitoring, monitoring tools so you can keep track of when something fails, it'll alert you. This is basically how it works. Um, you add a, add a job, call the add job function, give it a name, you add a step to the function, what that step will do, and then you update the step, what it did, how it did it. Um, this actually makes it easy to keep track if you have really, really long running functions and you want to see how they're progressing along. You can just call updates in a loop and then go query the, the job on table and whatever you're writing to that job, it'll keep track of things, how many rows it's doing, whatever it's doing. Um, if you just want to add another step, you just go and add another step and it'll keep going. And it also accounts for failure if you put a you can put a failed job call in the in the exception, and then you then you'll get whatever the error logs were, or the error message was in your log. This is basically what what the output looks like. I made some there's there's two tables there's a job log table and a job detail table. I made these functions just as convenience functions that you can just create the job log tables in, uh, directly. And this this is like these are individual jobs here. And then uh, this is like if you wanted to get into the individual steps of a job. So that was job ID 9 here. These are the individual steps of the job and what it did and where it did it. Um, so I use this one a lot because I can never remember exactly what the job's names are. So I made a convenience like function. The end, at the end, by default, it only, it'll give you back the most recent 10. If you need to get more than that back, it'll you just put a number in there. It'll give you the most recent 20, 50 jobs, whatever you need to do. And it also provides uh, monitoring. With this one, base, one, one function pretty much does all of this. It it's a, returns a record, so you can query it however you need to query it. Um, we've used this in Nagios, and we also, Omni PI also has a, a monitoring service called Protonus that we use. Um, how to do this, I have on my blog how to add to it, but if you've used Nagios before, these should look familiar. These are what basic Nagios replies usually look like, so they're built in a lot of the tools that people already made. So this is like when everything's working okay. This is when stuff's gone bad. Um, so say say you have a you have a function that runs uh, uh, runs must run every day, so um, you can actually um, there's some configuration options in here. You can tell it that um, you tell you give it the job name, and you tell it this 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 function must run every 24 hours. If it hasn't run in the last 24 hours, when you run check job status, it will come back and say like this like this says some other process is missing and when it last ran. So Nagios, Nagios knows to what critical means. It's just Nagios knows what that means when it gets back a response like that. So you'd make the, uh, the command and service checks in Nagios, 
and then Nagios would tell you, oh, this function didn't run. And by, def by default, I made this that if, if, a, if a function ever fails three times, that by default sets off a critical alarm. So if a function fails, if you're, something's run, runs every five minutes, and you want it to, you, it may like occasionally fail once, and it'll recover, it'll fix itself. So this will like alert you if it's failed three times in a row. You can change that however you want. It also has um, escalation. So like you can see, this is actually just a warning. So if something goes into warning three times, it'll escalate it to critical and let you know that it failed. So any other questions about this? This is the other extension I've been working on. Um, it's, looking for, it's a logical, logical or poor table replication extension. Um, I was looking for, uh, just went to uh, thesaurus.com looking for copy synonyms and that definition came up. Um, the thing that caught my mind on it for a mimeograph was low cost and small quantity. This is a very, very simplified logical replication solution compared to things like Ricardo and Sloney, which are I, I will admit, much more powerful than this replication tool is. If you need something that's, it, that's uh, you're going to be replicating a lot of tables and need, need to be more easily managed, those will probably be better off. If you're looking for something to just replicate a few tables or need to do some of the specialized replication that this can do, um, this may work better for you. Um, the big thing also is it, uh, I can show here. So built into Postgres, as most of you know, is streaming and log shipping, but that's pretty much all or nothing. You can't pick up, except if you go to the next talk about how they're getting logic replication starting to built in to 9.4. Um, uh, hopefully, this may make this <coughs> extension obsolete, but you never know. Um, there's three basic uh, types of replication. I'll go over each of them individually. Um, the biggest thing is this: this requires no super user, other than installation, requires no super user to run. You just grant the permissions to the users that are running it, and it'll just work. Um, and this is installed and run from the destination database, so this is a pull thing. This is a pull replication, it's not push. So you set this up on your destination of where you want the data to go, and it pulls the data from however many sources you define. You can define as many sources as you want, all pulling to the same database. Um, has, some, has some other features, you can tell it you only want to replicate certain columns, and you can actually throw a where condition to only replicate certain rows as well. And it also uses the pg.mon extension to provide monitoring and uh, logging of what it does. So. Snapshot, easiest way, copies the whole table every time. So if this is like a, a very small table or a table that's not, uh, doesn't change very often, you see the last option there. If the source data hasn't changed, it actually just does nothing. So. Uh, but it does it in a specialized way to minimize uh, locking. It actually, it's a view on top of two tables, and when replication runs, it populates the other table, then swaps the view for a brief lock. So while replication is running, it doesn't actually have your whole table locked. It's just doing all that in the background and then swaps it for a brief second. Um, this is much faster. If, you're, if the majority of the table changes at all of the time, this is much, much faster than replaying the DML on the replication system. So you can just repull the whole date, the whole table, select star, grab it, and truncate and repopulate the table. Um, I actually check some of the system logs. You can actually look in the PG, PG stats ta all tables, something like that. I can't remember the view right now. It actually, there's actually uh, columns in there that, that have an incremental count of the number of inserts, updates, and deletes done on every table. So I just store that number and watch for it to change. And since it's redoing the whole table, I actually made it so it'll um, replicate column changes. So if you add new columns, drop columns, or change types, it'll it'll catch all that stuff too. Um, one of our clients had an issue with this though, because they were actually using this on one of their uh, development databases. And a view is not the same thing as a real table. It has no sequences, all that kind of stuff. So I made this basic table replication option. Locks the whole table every time you do replication, but it actually will let you um, have the sequence numbers and foreign keys and all that kind of stuff working. And it'll manage resetting the sequences and foreign keys and all that kind of stuff. So it's good for a development database. If you just want to copy data from production to uh, 
<coughs> I develop my database. That's arbitrary to you. Um, could be could be a gigabyte, could be 100K. It's kind of up to you. Um, this is the other specialized type of replication. Uh, I call it incremental. Um, this is based on there being a column on the source that changes with every single insert or update. And that's a key part of it. It has to change with every single insert or update and update it to a new value. So this is actually very ideal for things like a, like a web hits tracking table that's just constantly getting hammered with, with uh, new data and you want to replicate that over. Putting it, most of the logical replication all re relies on triggers, which populate another queue table. So that makes your high traffic tables having to write to two tables every time when you want to replicate them. This allows you to um, avoid that. Um, so this, both snapshot table and this only require read access on the source database, it requires nothing else. So very, very non-invasive form of replication. Um, you do run into issues. As if with serial, you don't really run into too, too many issues, but timestamp, um, if you, you run into the daylight savings problem. The, the easiest way is to not use daylight, is to use GMT or UTC time for your database time. That will eliminate all of your problems, but not everybody can do that. And then the client we developed this for uh, runs their database in Eastern time. So easiest way to avoid that is to just not run replication during DSC, that two hour period. And that, that's the only way to, to really account for it. So if different places have different DST times, so that's configurable of when you want it to not run. So, but that's how I solve that. Yes? That is, that, that, can, that can be a problem and there can be, there can be data missed. That, that is one of the other issues with, with this type of replication. Um, yeah, um, by default it's, uh, for time by default it's 10 minutes. So it, it, your destination will essentially always be 10 minutes behind. So you set that, you set that boundary variable to when you know the source is done doing what it's doing. Like if it takes 15 minutes for all your inserts to do, you set the boundary variable to 15 minutes, it'll account for that not, not happening. The same thing with serial. Usually with serial it's a, it's a constantly incrementing number, so it's not a big deal. But if you're inserting the same number, over a long transaction period of time, you can have the same issue, but you can set the same kind of boundaries. Boundaries is actually another very big problem. You, you'd think this would be an easy replication type. It is not. There is a lot of edge cases with this, boundaries being one of the big issues with it, with handling things when, when replication runs, you grab a value, but that value is still being inserted on the source. Then you're using that boundary as your next uh, as your next group of data, you'll miss it completely. So there are some configuration options to allow you to handle that. Uh, I also added some, added some recent functions in this recently, for uh, for this both this one and this this type that will monitor if the source columns change. It will let you know. It can't replicate them automatically, but you at least have some monitoring to let you know if the source changes. You can go in there and fix that. This is the type of uh, logical replication that almost everybody does. I call it DML. Um, basically, it just replays inserts and updates with a trigger and a queue table to keep track of everything. Um, uh, like I said, it doesn't actually replay everything. Um, it replays all inserts and deletes, but if, say, you have 100,000 updates in between that time period, it will only replay the last one because it's just going by the primary key value. Um, this, this option does require a primary or unique key. So if you don't have that, the inserter or snapshot met replication methods can work for you. Um, I did handle it so it'll automatic the the trigger and the queue table they can put on the source automatically manages giving it the right grants and stuff that it needs. Um, and you can have multiple destinations. This does mean putting multiple triggers and multiple uh, queue tables on your source. So for every destination, you're writing to that many tables on your source. So I have a hard limit of 100, but as you're writing to that many tables, you're, I think you're already running into other issues. So uh, I also did this other option that we have data warehousing uses that um, you don't want to you don't want to um, audit every in every update or anything, but you want to audit when a row is deleted. You want to keep that row around. This will allow you to keep the uh, deleted rows on your destination. 
um, just adds an extra column on the destination of when the row is deleted and keeps it around. Um, some uses for this where we, where we do it. Uh, so you have an audit table in your source database and you want to keep track of the audit, all, the, the entire audit log on another offsite data warehouse. You don't want to keep the entire audit log on your production database. Um, that works really well with um, the incremental uh, replication. So you can do partitioning on your source table and drop all the old data and keep all the audit log tables on your other offsite database. Uh, we've actually also used this to do upgrades across major versions. Uh, we did an upgrade from 8.1 to 9.2 with this, um, basically took the, what you do is you, you take the, 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 the largest tables, which is usually not the majority of the tables, it's usually like maybe the top 20 or 50. So this does require you to set each individual, ta individual table up for replication, but setting up 20, 30 tables isn't that big of a deal. So you set those tables up with replication from the old one to the new one, and that gets you the majority of the data across to your new database, and then you just do a dump on the smaller data, on the smaller tables, and significantly reduces the um, downtime to the upgrade. What could have taken five, six hours is now down to maybe five minutes because you've got the majority of the data already replicating over. And we actually had somebody else that used this for, uh, they, had a, they had a sharded Postgres system that, uses, that used a UUID, so they had 512 shards, uh, uh, sharded uh, Postgres database across 512 databases, but they needed to do reporting on it. So they set uh, 512 replication jobs to pull from all 512 tables to a single database and then did reporting on that. So use cases I would have never even thought of that somebody else that used this did with it. So. Yes. The, 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 the snapshot one can handle getting the getting the, the new column changes over. The other one, the other application methods cannot, so it won't automatically do that. I, I have some monitoring functions to monitor for if the things change. Um, with a DML, that's actually tricky. You have to do the you have to do the column change in a specific order. You have to add the new column to first. You add the col new column to the destination. Then you add the new column to the trigger. Then you add the new column to your actual source table. Because if you do it out of order, then you start getting errors on the replication. So it is a tricky issue. Um, I, I document I have in the documentation how to do how to handle column column changes with DML. So I that, that's the way I, I just don't handle I don't I can't handle it in this in, except in the snapshot sense. Yep. Um, any other questions about this extension? This has been, been my biggest project and so far gotten the most feedback on it was um, Postgres has no automated partitioning built into it. Um, it has a very, very extensive documentation on how to write partitioning and use table inheritance in the core documentation. And that's pretty much what I based this extension on. So um, if, you look at, if you look at the source code of it, you'll see this looks exactly like the way the core developers intend partitioning to work. So. Um, but this takes care of, uh, like if you want to write partitioning yourself, you have to write, uh, handle keeping all the tables up to date, keeping the trigger up to date, keeping the functions up to date. If you're just doing a, a, like basic alphabetical partitioning, that's kind of a once and done setup and you're done. But things for time and, and serial uh, ID partitioning, you need to have ongoing maintenance. So this is what this one is uh, designed to do. It only handles um, time and serial based partitioning. I started out with including some basic uh, pre-made uh, time, time series, um, yearly, quarterly, monthly, hourly. Um, recently, I actually got custom time. You can actually set any time interval you want. Um, adds a little bit more overhead to it. So uh, I'll get into what static and dynamic triggers are uh, a little bit later as far as partitioning. But um, it'll, it, it, you can basically, you could partition by three and a quarter hours if you wanted. It allows you to do that. Um, uh, the other thing with partitioning is um, if you wait to create the partition when the partition is needed, like, uh, like, as, like you're doing serial and right when you need the new table, 
if you wait to do it till then, you run into race conditions. And uh, this avoids that, the race conditions, by pre-creating the partitions. Um, by default, it saves four ahead. You can set that to whatever you want it to be. Um, and I also have it managing all most of the properties of the, of the style tables listed there, indexes, constraints, defaults, privileges, ownership. I actually had somebody that had OID set on their parent table and they had to do a patch recently to actually account for OIDs being inherited as well. Um, you set all that on the parent table and it takes care of uh, uh, putting all that on the child tables. Um, just two days ago, I actually got foreign key inheritance working. So if you have foreign keys on the partition set to another table, they will inherit from the parent um, to the child. Um, foreign keys in the other direction in Postgres, like to a partition set, do not work. Um, actually, there is a way to do it. And the reason it doesn't work is because there's a lot of, it doesn't work because um, when you do a foreign key on a partition set, it only looks at the parent table. It doesn't look at any of the child tables in the, inher in the inheritance tree. So you can actually make a trigger to do that for you. But if you have a really, really large partition set, every single insert to that source table will take a very, very long time. So um, this takes care of um, updating the triggers as are needed. Um, that was a very, the object name length is a very, one of those things that you don't usually think about when you're setting up partitioning, especially in serial partitioning. That can be a, a big problem where the, the, the partition, you usually like do like underscore P and then like a date or a number for the partition name. For serial, that continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, you run into that 63 character limit. And usually, your, your partition suffix is how you're identifying what the data is in there. So Postgres just truncates it. It doesn't give you, doesn't like stop you from doing it. It allows you to create your table. It just truncates it all. So if you had a very long table name that was partitioned by day and it cut it off right in the middle of the year, you just kind of lost the, the whole semantic naming of how your partitioning works. So this handles it by just truncating the, the actual name of the table and then adding the suffix on it to try to get around that. And I also, in a recent version, um, constraint exclusion is one of the reasons people do partitioning. So if, uh, if you're doing a select and you only want the most, you're, you have 10 years of data, but you only want the recent month, and you do a query with a where condition on the partitioning column, it'll only look at the tables with the most recent month and won't even consider the previous one. As soon as you do a where condition on one of the other columns, not when you don't include the control column, does a sequential scan or index scans across the entire partition set, which is a, is a downfall of it. So what I did was um, I used this uh, pre-create number. Like I said, the default was four. It actually That actually controls the trigger of where, where it's um, what tables it's handling for the data. So with four, it handles four tables in, in the future and four tables in the past. And we'll continue moving that. So what I did was um, if you give it other column names, any tables older than those four, it will look at the current values that are in the, ta that are in the table and add a constraint on the table based on those values. So you can actually have exclusion constraint on the other columns in the partition set. It only works if the data is sta static. If your old data is changing, obviously this won't work. But um, most of the time where people need that, the, the old data is static. So does that make sense? Anybody have any questions about that? I don't, I actually, somebody was just talking to me yesterday about that at the Royal Oak. It does not support subpartitioning yet automatically. I mean, if you, if you can somehow, I, I don't, it would be kind of hard to manage, but you could manually kind of manage doing subpartitioning with this, but it doesn't have it automatically. I'm not sure if I can get that built in. I have it in my notes to see if I can, but. Uh, I, I ha I, it's basically functions. I have a, a create. Uh, first, you create the parent table. It, the parent table already exists. And then there's a function called create, create parent. And you give it the parent table, the column, um, and whatever other things you do. And, yeah, I'm curious. and you, so you can either do that with a new, brand new table or an existing table. If you have an existing table and you need to partition data on, this will do the, parti the partitioning for you. Um, so there's a Python script to do it automatically. Um, 
it does a commit after each partition is created by default, but you can actually make it uh, and do it in smaller batches, like the example I have now. Um, this is actually like I told you about the hits table. We actually had a, a hits table. This is a hit, like a web hits table that we partitioned live while traffic was still coming in. Um, the only lock this ever requires is a brief two or three second lock on the parent. That, that's actually long because this is a very, very busy, busy table. It's the only reason it took two or three seconds to get the lock on the table. Usually it's pretty instant. And then um, you can see uh, we partition it by day, but there's options to the partition to, to the uh, partitioning function to give do do the commits in smaller blocks so there's less contention. So um, we did it in hourly blocks with a five second wait to not overwhelm the wall screen, and uh, took about probably took about ten hours, but there was no interruption to production and partitioning was done. Um, I actually have, that's actually the opposite direction I was thinking to do, but I was actually, I'm actually working on a consolidation script. So like say you have, you're like partitioning hourly or daily, but like after a year you want to just change to yearly partitioning. I'm working on a script to change to do that. I will see if I can do in the opposite direction as well. I don't, I don't see why that, that might actually be a little bit more tricky, but. Uh, there's actually, um, I'll get to that in a little bit. You can actually undo partitioning in this. It just undoes it completely, but it does undo partitioning. Um, this is getting into what the difference between static uh, partitioning and dynamic partitioning was. Um, one thing that drives me nuts when people, they actually have like their functions writing functions or functions writing SQL. They just have it write one long line and then it's unreadable. These, this is actually a live function, trigger function that this writes, so I tried to make them readable. Um, but basically what a static means is you actually explicitly um, name each individual partition for each condition in the if condition. Um, this allows it to, uh, to attach the query plan. It makes it, very, makes it a lot faster. So in, in this instance, and then I also actually also have it like alternating. This is with the pre-make value set to two. So you can see like this is the current table. This is one in the past, one in the future, two in the past, two in the future. So it kind of alternates to try to keep the, the if condition um, be the most recent value so it doesn't have to go down through the entire list. But this is the, the most efficient version of partitioning. It's what people mostly do for, for uh, their partitioning sets. The issue with this is um, if you want to keep being able to insert to a lot of tables, like hundreds and hundreds of them, then you have a list of if conditions that is hundreds and hundreds of lines long and impacts the performance of your of the partitioning. So if you run into that, that's when it's usually time to go into dynamic. Can't explain that part too much right now, but basically what it's doing is it's doing an execute statement and the, the partition name is um, variable. So at the time of insertion, it determines what the partition it, what partition it goes in and then inserts that. The problem with this is execute statements aren't, uh, the plans aren't cacheable. So this has to reevaluate the, the the query plan every single time the insert is done. So depending on your partitioning method, that's why I included both of these options because um, depending on your data model, it, you, you need one or the other. So I kind of try to include both of these. The, uh, the custom time partitioning um, option actually uses this and it also does a lookup table so that's actually the least performant of the partitioning methods. But a lookup table is basically the only way to do custom time partitioning that I've been able to figure out. So it's, it's still pretty fast, but obviously the, if you start running into really high um, insertion rates, you can run into the, those kind of issues. The other thing with, um, for time-based partitioning, the, new, the creation of new partitions is based on running a cron job with a with a, a, a function that this includes. Um, by default, serial replication will go by when the, when the current table reaches 50% of its, uh, whatever its max constraint is, it will go on to making the next partition in the future. Um, some people have reported for, for very, very, very high traffic tables, that causes a lot of contention because one 
one update will, one insert will come along and say, I need to make the new table. Then the next insert comes along right away before the new table is even created and has to wait. So that, that method is, is one of the issues. So I actually made it so you can, I did it that way because ID based partitioning is usually not predictable of how often you have to run the, uh, the cron job to keep it up to date. But I made it optional now. So you can actually, if you know how often you need to run it, you run it that often and it doesn't do the 50% creation anymore, so it avoids the contention there. Um, any questions about static versus dynamic partitioning? Automated creation, you can also have automated destruction. Uh, this is the other big reason people do um, partitioning is um, if you have very, very large tables and you have to delete 100 million, 200 million rows, it's a very expensive delete operation and massively bloats your table. And the only way to clean that up is either a vacuum full, which will lock your table, or using something like uh, PP repack. Um, but um, this allows you to just drop the table, which is a very fast option. And this allows you to automate that. So you just set for time. You can set it to a value. Anything older than three months, it will automatically drop the table. By default, it just uninherits it. It doesn't actually drop it. So I try to make it safe. So if you actually want to drop the tables, you have to tell it you want to drop the tables. Um, and you can actually have it only drop the table or just drop the index if you want to keep the table and save the space. So you just want to keep it around. And uh, for, and I also do that for serial. Serial is a little bit more complex. I try to explain it as best I could. You give it a boundary value and it'll go whatever the current max minus that value is, it'll drop those other tables. Um, somebody actually. At another conference, this is another reason I talk about this at a conference is because I get ideas for stuff like this, is they actually needed to dump out the tables. They don't even want the data in the database. They want it compressed and archived outside of the database. But the way he did it, he used the PLSH language, um, which I started to try to do, but realized it was very, very limiting. You would essentially require the shell, shell being able to be available to whatever platform you're on, which makes it pretty much useless on Windows. Um, so I, I actually did it. It will actually move the table out of the schema. And then there's a script that um, will dump out the tables from that schema. And will only drop the table if the pg dump command comes back successfully. So it's, I try to keep it as safe as I can. And like I said, I do have un, un, partitioning undo. So it won't, it won't do like you're saying to um, automatically change it from yearly to monthly or something like that. But you can undo your current partitioning and redo the partitioning again. So, uh, what was I say? Oh, um, the undo portion will actually, partitioning works with the, 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 uh, the table inheritance feature of Postgres. So um, the undo will actually work for any inheritance table, not just ones that partition that PG Partner manages. So if you have another table inheritance table you have set up and you want to undo that, this, this tool will actually work with any of them. So, yeah. um, this tool, I don't think David Wheeler's in this talk, um, but this tool has saved my sanity in developing these extensions. Um, PGTAP is, a, is unit testing for Postgres. Um, basically, you can tell it, I, want, I run this query, I want this result back. Does this table exist? Does this primary key exist? Does this trigger exists, all of those conditions you want to check if you run something. This allows you to do unit testing for. Um, this has been the only way I've been able to release things even semi-bug free. Um, Mimeo has about 300 uh, PG tap tests. The partition manager has close to 4,000 to try to manage all of the different type partition types and for time and all that kind of stuff. I'd never be able to make sure all of that stuff works without something like this. So those you use this, go find David Wheeler. He can talk to you about it. But I love this tool. So I would, I would just make this say this is essential if you're doing any extension development at all. I mean, it may, may be useful in your, your own functions. But if you start looking into extensions that you want to release to the public, I would highly recommend using this. That's it. These are the, the links to all my tools. Um, like I said, um, I. New zero C. Not all of these function. All of these uh, extensions are written in PLPGSQL. They're not C, so they're a little bit easier to dig into the code of how they work. I knew zero C before I started working on the API, and I still don't know very much yet. 
my only attempt at writing a C function, seg called the data -date database, so I don't know what I'm doing in that sense. But I've still been able to write extremely, extremely useful tools for, uh, for Postgres. Um, and just thank the community of, of Planet Postgres and the announcement lists and the conferences and all that kind of stuff and Pug that have allowed this stuff to exist and be popular for people to know about it. So, thank you. Any other questions about anything? No. Postgres doesn't have partitioning built in. No. No, you can't. There's no partitioning built in. There's table inheritance, but that's not that's not partitioning. That's I mean, you can have. It's like the the the. I can take all this off. The uh, 